God is with me, but I am angry with him. Why this terrible injustice? Or is this the product of pride? This sense of wrestling against God or the angel of God is distressing. What can I do against God? I don't want to be fighting against God's will. How am I failing him or what does he need to teach me? What is the purpose of this ordeal? Will I ever know or continue to be puzzled, angered, and feel quite abandoned by the one I serve? Fill me with peace, Lord. May the conditions not deny my love for you. I am ready to die, though I miss my family. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I will trust in God, though he will slay me. Yet I will trust him. He is the way, the truth, the light. Welcome back to Tragedy with a View. Amen. Sounded like a prayer. Something different. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick. I'm your host, Kayla. Sam is back with me. I'm back. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. I was going to say he didn't do that, but yes, he did. Well, it wasn't appropriate at that time. I'm sure there will be some times. There, there will be very quickly. So that way I don't forget. I don't remember if I put it in my draft or not, but the intro is directly written from the victim in this story and we'll get to why but i wanted to make sure that that is known ahead of time in case i forget to say it later really quick housekeeping i'm going to keep this one short january i i looked at the numbers today this is february 1st i looked at january's numbers and it was by far the most successful month Woo! for my nice little podcast. And for those of you who have listened through all of the sound quality issues, I really, really appreciate. We appreciate you. Yeah. I. You are troopers. I, for sure. I um, definitely have learned a lot and I think the kinks are finally worked out. Knock on wood. As long as nothing breaks, I think I think I'm good to go. I don't even know what all of the contraptions names are that I am using currently to do this, but um, pretty much everything's new gear. And again, thank you for sticking it out and uh, listening to the actual story rather than the way that it sounded. And for people who are new here, and this is the the episode that you're starting with, and you go back, you're probably going to be disappointed with the sound quality and I'm sorry but again thank you I appreciate you second uh what I really want to do is take a minute to ask you to please leave a review I started doing some research on specifically Spotify and Apple algorithms and their hosting and reviews are huge there's no other way around it and while I don't have any specific goals for where this podcast goes, I do want it to grow. And if it grows, then I can continue to, to give you guys more content and more stories. So please leave a review. We would like to thank you in advance for taking time out of your day to write something about the podcast. Yeah. It really means something to your lovely host, Kayla. It and does. I would like to see her smile. <laughs> Sam's being a sweetheart over there. Okay. We are going to talk about Mike Turner. Who? I forgot something. We're going to come back to this. I have one other thing that I want to tell my listeners. I have started listening to podcasts again. And I stopped for like... I don't know, six, seven-ish months while I was figuring out my own voice for my own podcast. I didn't want anybody else to like influence me or me to compare myself to people who have been doing this for years and sometimes decades. And so I just completely cut out all podcasts. And then I learned in the last month or so that I've been re-listening to to the shows that I've really enjoyed. I hate ads. I hate them. 
As a listener, I hate them. As a host, I understand them. I find that they're beneficial in some ways. And I for sure was working on some ad related content. And now that I'm listening to podcasts again, and I realize how much I actually hate ads, um, I'm going to hold off on that for as long as possible for you guys. I really hate ads. And I'm sure you guys do too. Everyone hates ads. They just get skipped anyway. Yeah. And it it, it interrupts the story. And it's, I hate them with everything in my being. So while that was an avenue that I was going down for a little short period of time, I am not now. And uh, because of that, I also want to to plug in a real quick. Um, Sam created a board game called Seabound. And if you like board games, you should definitely check it out. Seabound is a three to six player. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, if you like board games. It was fun. Yeah. I'll put a um, link in the show notes. And anyways, all right. It's to the story. We are talking about Mike Turner. Mike was a tall but lovable guy standing six foot, six inches. He made easy friends with others. And with his 10 years of being a pastor at the Boone Memorial Presbyterian Church, this was clear by the community that surrounded him. Mike often related the outdoors to his preaching and relationship with God, and he was an experienced and natural outdoorsman. Mike's lovable and equally thrilled in the outdoors companion was his black lab mix, whose name is Andy. Nice. At 48 years old, Mike had spent a significant amount of time outdoors, and he loved to do it alone to connect with God and to connect with nature. Do you mean that he liked to bring his dog along too? Yes. His dog was his hiking companion. Friends who he hiked with found themselves in deep theoretical conversations. And once his friends... Sounds like my type of guy. I want to go on a hike with Mike. Hike with Mike. Nice. Let's make it a thing. Any Mikes out there listening. Hike with Mike. We're here for you. Uh, One of his friends in particular mentions that Mike felt closest to God when he was in the high country, which also makes me think of like the Southern, this is completely off the rails, but it makes me think of the Southern, like higher the hair, the closer to God thing. (laughs) Okay. So like when you're in the mountains, you're closer. But I think... In the Patreon exclusive episode that Ann and I did just this last week, we talked about how mountains are really just a spiritual experience. They they are. There's something about them that makes you have to kind of dig in and know yourself a little bit better to truly enjoy everything that they have to offer. And clearly, Mike understood this. He was married to Diane, and together they had three children, Katie, Jill, and Ben, who, from my understanding at this point, were all basically adults. If not, like, I feel like the youngest would be late teens. In 1998, Mike was wrapping up a three-month sabbatical, and he was craving some time alone to challenge his body and his spirit. He decided to go into the Wind River Range in western Wyoming, which I did not realize how intense this area was until I actually started researching this episode. And so I generally cover it. So there's there's more information. And if you've ever been out in it, you're probably like, yeah, you're not even scratching the surface. But Where are we going? When... When do you want to stop working so we can go? Do you need to stop working to go? Oh. You need to stop working so we can go. (laughs) you schedule it for us, and I have done perfectly fine with going along for the ride. I mean, we already have like three vacations, maybe four, planned for the year. That is a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot for you. 
It is. So, I'm, a, I'm a one vacation a year guy. Yep. You know, uh, the Wind River Range is in western Wyoming, kind of near the Teton Yellowstone area. There are 48 peaks that rise above 12,500 feet or 3,800 meters in the span of 100 miles or 161 kilometers. The area encompasses 2.25 million acres of wilderness. And the highest peak is Gannett Peak, which is 13,804 feet high or 4,200 meters. Do we have any context in comparison to other mountains we would know? Like, is that half as tall as Mount Everest? For reference, Denali is 20,310 feet or uh, 6,100 meters. So 60% 60 of the highest mountain in the United States. Yes. It is it is not the highest peak in the United States, the continental United States, but it's still it's still up there. There are roughly 600 miles of trails within the Wind River Range and 80 miles make up part of the Continental Divide National Scenic Trail and in the southern section of the park it's is the Cirque of Towers which has peaks that drop off into sheer walls of granite that rock climbers are drawn to. This area also has seven of the largest glaciers that are still active in the United States, continental United States. That's interesting. Clear meadows give way to mountains that climb towards the sky. The sun shines and brightens even the most densely forested areas. And the stunning blue waters look both beautiful and refreshing. So who wouldn't want to take some time to be out there? Mike had these same thoughts and he planned a 60-mile hike through the Bridger Wilderness area. His plan was to skip the trails and quote-unquote Wander and wonder, as he titled his trip. Hike with Mike. Wander and wonder. You're going to learn so much about yourself. I it, would do that. I want to do that. Okay. Let's go. Pack up right now. Pack up. <laughs> See you guys. His plan was to start at the Bridger Teton National Forest, and it would take him over the Continental Divide twice traverse Knife Point Glacier, ascend over the 12,150-foot Indian Pass, enter the Fitzpatrick Wilderness Area, and end his adventure at the Big Sandy Trailhead, where he would meet his family after nine days. So he was going to hike all of this with his dog Andy in nine days, which sounds insane to me, but at the same time, he's a very experienced outdoorsman. So this was probably like a walk in the park, literally, for him. Yeah, I mean, 11 miles a day. I think that obviously going the elevation is definitely the difficult. Mm-hmm. It almost makes it like double the distance and effort, probably. Yeah. Is he, uh, is he, does he have to do any climbing? Not technical. Oh, okay. So he's like, okay. Still, I mean, it's still very difficult to yeah. hike up yeah. elevation. So he also had a plan B where he would meet his family at a nearby lake if he happened to be running late. Giving a detailed itinerary to his wife, Diane, she could see that he planned to stay near Eckland Lake his first night work his way up to Knife Point Glacier, and then turn south toward Alpine Lakes Pass, and so on. On July 30th, 1998, Mike and Andy packed up the car, and before leaving his home, he gave his wife a bouquet of flowers and a card that read, Thank you for letting me live this adventure. Know that wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, I'm thinking of you. And with that, he was off. How sweet. He he sounds... 
He sounds like a great guy. He sounds sweet. He's Maybe so- I'll have to take a note out of his book. I'll write you a cute note before mm-hmm. I go on my adventure, solitary adventure. When I go hike with Mike. Okay. I'll just go out to the backyard and pick roses off the bushes. <laughs> Good idea. Okay. On August 8th, the designated day that Mike was intending to exit the wilderness, Diane sat near the trailhead and was really frustrated that Mike hadn't shown up yet. She knew that along with being an experienced outdoorsman, he was also an avid photographer and she was mostly annoyed that she was having to do all of the work of getting their gear to the lake because he hadn't shown up. But this frustration soon gave way to worry. By Sunday at 4 p.m., Mike still hadn't arrived and their youngest daughter, Katie, mentioned that she and her dad had agreed that if he hadn't arrived by then, they would need to call for help. However, Diane was hesitant because on the map she held in her hands were the words in bold letters, you will be charged for the rescue cost, i.e. helicopter time or horse rental. Hmm, that's weird. Is that normal? Yes. Oh. I think there's only certain circumstances in certain areas that if you call for a rescue, you won't be charged. I know a lot of places also have the rule that if you call for a rescue and it's not actually a rescue, you will be charged for that. I mean, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a, that's weird. It's a fine line to walk Mm. when you're making that decision to do something or wait, especially when you know someone is very experienced and knows the outdoors and has a tendency to maybe linger to take pictures. I mean, I'm I'm not a picture taker. I am not one of those people who lingers on the trail. If I'm going somewhere, if I've got a destination I'm going to, I'm going to it. Me too. So, yeah, which is why we're great together, except you keep going like a machine and my blood pressure drops and I start feeling sick and I need carbs and we never pack enough. So Not enough cookies. Not enough cookies. Anyways, by the time the sun set that Sunday, August 9th, Diane had made up her mind. At 10.06 the following morning, Diane called the Sublette County Sheriff's Office to report Mike missing. She handed the itinerary over to Search and Rescue, hoping it would clue them in on where Mike was. Dale Holgate, who was the search commander for Tip Top Search and Rescue Organization, designated teams to comb the area. Dale had 18 years of search and rescue experience and helped to build the organization to what it became, the first call. The area he would be searching in included two national forests, two sides of the Continental Divide, two counties, three designated wilderness areas, and the Wind River Indian Reservation. The area was wild and dense, and even if you had every volunteer in Wyoming walking hand in hand, you still wouldn't be able to cover even half of the area they were looking in. So I just want to confirm something. So was this after the nine days? Yes. Okay. He, he, this wasn't before I, okay. Yeah. He was intending to meet his family at the end of his nine days in the wilderness. And when he did not show up, they called for help. Weather reports for the prior 10 days showed that the area had vast fluctuations in temperatures ranging from over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius during the day and plummeting to 39 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 degrees Celsius at night. This fluctuation has a heart effect on the body, resulting in about two and a half quarts of fluid being lost from the average man while he is at rest per day. And as we know, Mike was not at rest. He was doing some pretty grueling hiking. 
of course, this increases with exertion as well as heat exposure and wind. As the body loses water, you also lose body weight, which is important for this next part, which when you have lost 0.8% of your body weight, you start to feel thirsty. 3 to 4% leads to extra fatigue and mental confusion. Once you've lost 10% of your body weight, your physical body as well as your mind begins to deteriorate. And 15 to 25% loss causes death. And that's a big range because that then starts to factor in your physical condition as well. So this is over a short period of time. It can be over a short period of time if you're able to get water, like small amounts of water. It can... So like a period of di- dehydration. Yes. No. Yes. It's it's a, a mostly linear thing. If you're able to get small amounts of water throughout the duration of this, but you're still trending downward, it's just going to prolong what is happening. Hmm. So versus, say, I don't have water for 24 hours, I lose 15%, I'm dead. Versus I had a tablespoon of water like every hour, I might get two to three days before I hit that that 15% mark. And Fighters fluctuate 10% in one day, and that's why they're falling over on the scale sometimes. Interesting. That is interesting. Yep. It's not healthy. I don't like it. I I will now go on a soapbox. I won't, but. Thank you. Not the place. We'll give you your own podcast for that. Well, let me back up. Because of this knowledge that the temperatures were varying and they knew that this is hard on the body, they had multiple teams working on several, several different avenues at once a group called the Hasty Team searched the itinerary route. Every trailhead and storefront had a poster put up with Mike's face on it. Mike and Diane's children took the task of checking trailhead registers, found phone numbers online for the people who had signed in during that period that Mike was there, and contacted those people asking if they had seen Mike. A significant number of volunteers showed up to search the area in an effort to find Mike, and many of these volunteers were family and friends and members of the church, which is a testament to how much Mike was loved and the impact he had on other people's lives. On August 23rd, so two weeks after the search began, they had no leads and the call to stop searching was made. While the case wasn't closed and the intention to investigate any new leads would still be actively pursued, the team had done everything that they could do with no results. They didn't have any other avenues to search or potentially find Mike. So do they still charge them if they don't find them? I don't know. Mm. That would suck. That is that is a question. I don't have an answer to. In addition to the fact that they had no leads, they also had statistically searches that end in a body recovery. Three quarters of those, the person dies within the first three days. So statistically speaking, There was a 25% chance that he survived the first three days of the search or the first three days that he was quote unquote missing because he was gone for nine days. He had no contact with anyone for nine days. Nobody knew where or what happened to him and when. So the chances of finding him alive after those two weeks were very small. Not, Not none but very small. Yeah, it's a long time. Miraculously, on August 28th, so five days later, 
two hikers came out of the trail with Andy. He was clearly sore and exhausted and about 20 pounds lighter than he had been previously, but after a month in the wilderness, he was alive, but without Mike. This prompted a new search, which started on August 31st, with the hope that this new information would lead somewhere. A team again started where Mike had, and they were hoping that Andy would lead the way to where Mike was. On September 3rd, the team was just about to work their way onto the glacier when their radios cracked with the directions to turn around that a hiker had shown up at the sheriff's office carrying a wallet, and it belonged to Mike. So we're going to back up to August 31st, the same day that the team set off with Andy in search for Mike, Jeff Stewart a hiker from San Diego was hiking a very similar route as Mike and was making his way along brown cliffs near an unnamed lake. He was paying close attention to his footing as he noticed the rocks seemed to shift and move under every step. He looked up after a moment and saw someone sitting in the rocks. The man was about 50 yards away, so Jeff called a greeting and asked if he needed any help. When he didn't get a response, he went over to investigate, and before he reached the man, he realized that this was the lost hiker whose face was on the posters at the trailhead. He was 25 miles from where he started his hike. A helicopter from Fremont County Search and Rescue recovered his body the next day on September 4th. So what happened? Would you like to make a guess? Sounds like with the foreshadowing of your writing that he, the rock slid out from under him. That's my guess. You are right on the head. That's just good writing. We'll talk about it. According to Mike's journal, on August 2nd, just after lunch, when Mike and Andy were climbing over this rocky ridge to get to the lake, that sat at an elevation of 11,400 feet or 3,475 meters, one of the boulders beneath his feet shifted a bit. This caught Mike off guard, and he leapt forward to the next boulder to get off of the one that was shifting beneath him. When he landed, his boots didn't hold traction because of the angle the boulder was at, and he went sliding down feet first, At the same time, the boulder that he had been on rolled forward and this boulder collided with the back of Mike's knees and pinned him between the two rocks. Not what you want. Not what you want. The boulder had been moving slowly enough that it didn't break or injure Mike's legs, just simply trapped his legs right above the knee and his feet were dangling down below. He was facing away from the boulder that was pinning him, and he was also facing towards the lake that he had been going to. With the boulder being about the size of a small car and weighing roughly 800 pounds, Mike struggled to shift it enough to move his legs. First, he tried his hands, and then he tried using his camera tripod as a lever He was able to get the boulder to shift enough that the pressure on his legs was relieved, but not enough that he could free himself. He felt panic well up inside himself, and in order to get a grip, he pulled out his journal and started writing. It was here that a key piece of information was provided, and he documented what was on his mind and what was occurring each day. The key piece of information is that he went off of his intended route. No. Yeah. When he was on the glacier, Mike and Andy were having a really tough time without having crampons or an ice axe or ice spikes on their shoes. And he could tell that Andy's paws were really starting to hurt him. Instead of following his intended path while on the glacier, where Mike should have turned south He decided to turn north instead because this would get them off of the glacier faster 
It had a lower elevation and was less traveled, but Mike felt that this was going to be easier on both him and Andy. As night fell, Andy laid on the rocks above Mike, and Mike took out his sleeping bag and stuffed it around himself as best as he could. He had a makeshift camp around him and was extremely concerned about the fact that he only had two quarts of water on him. The irony of this was that the lake was only 25 to 30 feet away. Additionally, he used his camera as a wedge between the rocks to help lessen the pressure on his legs, and he had a rain fly for his tent that he doubled as a way to shade himself from the summer sun and also collect any rain for drinking water. Mike knew that he really needed to have access to water, and once the water he was carrying ran out, he started grasping for snow that he could melt and then drink that way, and he also had a length of rope in his bag, which he then used to tie to his water bottle, and he threw his water bottle towards the lake. Unfortunately, this got stuck on some rocks and he wasn't able to pull it all the way back to him. So he lost that option as well. This is getting worse. This is great. I'm sorry. Thank you for doing this with me. The boulders held onto cold air and during the night between the temperature drop and the cold boulders, Mike woke up every morning shivering and wondering if this was the last night he would survive without getting hypothermia. As Mike's mind deteriorated, he began hallucinating and he wrote at one point that he saw Diane and Katie standing nearby. On the fifth day, Mike was putting his journal into a a Ziploc bag to protect it and In a jolted movement, he accidentally knocked this out of his reach. And so, because he couldn't go without writing, he pulled out the instructions for his first aid kit. He had a small Bible that he carried with him and the instructions for his camp stove and started first by filling the blank pages that were in his Bible and then started writing along the margins of the instruction booklets. While the days drug on, Mike strained to hear any voices of hikers. After a few days, Mike shot upright at the sound of a helicopter. It was out of sight, but he could tell that it was south of him. Eventually, it faded, and that's when Mike really started to accept that he felt his fate was coming to his death. This helicopter that he heard was the one Dale Holgate was inside of while searching for him. Mike removed his wedding ring and placed it on the rocks because he was worried that it would slip off of his finger and get lost. And by the ninth day, his writing was nearly unreadable. In the days that followed, there were no writings at all. An autopsy determined that Mike had died on or near August 11th from hypothermia and dehydration. Much later in an online forum, a hiker writes, Mike Turner, who had a story in Backpacker Magazine, became trapped in the rocks next to a small tarn. The rocks on the left side of of that tarn are all large on a 45-degree slope and very unstable. What's a tarn? It is a mountain lake. Oh. Is Crater Lake a tarn? Crater Lake is a geologically interesting tarn lake. Cool. Yeah. Uh, The writer says that they are all on it. All large on a 45-degree slope and very unstable. They constantly grind and hissed as I walked across them like I was walking on a spider web. Only after I crossed it did I realize that this is where Mike died. Diane somehow found this post and she wrote back saying that it really helped her to see and understand more about where Mike died and how he could have died there and it's 
just a freak accident and a perfect example of how you can be experienced and smart and athletic and good and still mother nature doesn't hold judgments and there is no mercy, just luck. Well, I mean, good and bad only matters to moral creatures. There's my philosophical quote. There are no moral creatures in nature. It just happens. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Sucks. It does suck. Thank you for doing this with me, Sam. I know that you're. Uh, it makes me sad to hear things that don't end well. The next story we do will be positive one. I mean, it does. You just have to have the right perspective about it. That, I, go ahead. I think what I find really beautiful in this story is that it it can show how you can be angry and you can be mad and you cannot understand and you can feel a lot of negative feelings, but still choose and honor the being that those negative feelings are directed towards. And I think a lot of people feel negative things and just associate negative feelings with bad. So whatever is causing those feelings, that that person or that being or that action or that experience is bad. And it just is. It yeah, it might not does it suck? Yes. Are your negative feelings valid? Yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that shouldn't be respected. That's my thought on it. I think that's an, uh, an important thing for something. I think that's a good explanation for something like these stories because it's hard to find the silver lining in a tragic event like this. There is no silver lining. Get well, rid of that idea. Well, <laughs> from from a human perspective, it's like you want to try to find a silver lining, but that's not the point of this story. It's like you have to kind of look at it from a different perspective. And it for me, it's like this story doesn't make me feel good, but if I shift my perspective and use it as fuel to be thankful for what I have and have understanding for the dangers of nature mm -hmm. that are outside of my control, then I can better appreciate stories like this I have eventually. I have one very important question. Yes. Do you still want to go? Sure, just not that. <laughs> We're going to stay on the path. We're going to, yeah, I'm I'm a big for staying on the path and um, carrying bear spray, as you already know. And if things start to get sketchy, it's not worth it for me. If there's multiple trees covering the path. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it. That yeah, that's trees are one thing. That's not that bad. But as long as there's not any bees in them, <laughs> just wear red. All right, Sam. Thank you for doing this with me. You're welcome, Kayla. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Please take a moment to rate and subscribe from wherever you listen to Tragedy with a View. To get access to ad-free episodes, bonus content, and more, please join us on our Patreon. The link will be in the show notes. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And to share a story of your own, send us a campfire confessional email at tragedywithaview at gmail.com. We'll see you next time.